welcome you all to our 16th, this is a round number workshop, 16th annual workshop on uh, CHAMP++. We need an extra bit next year um, the, the, on, on um, CHAMP++ and its applications. It's, uh, uh, it's interesting to think about the 16, uh, 16 years that we have been doing this, but, uh, um, but one thing that has been invariant is me talking about what CHAMP++ is. Of course, what it is is changed. But uh, for some reason, I, I was not on the title slide. So, um, so I'm going to be uh, brief because we all want to hear uh, Ron afterwards and uh, uh, not to spend too much time at the beginning. But I want to do three things. One is set the context for the workshop by talking about CHAMP++ uh, for the, a few, few of you who are new. And every year there are few. And of course, on the webcast, there is a live webcast going on. Uh, so please, all the speakers, make sure to speak into the microphone for that reason. Um, and, um, and so I'm going to review CHAMP++ very briefly, five minutes maybe, and then I'm going to uh, talk about uh, one issue of interest to me, looking to the future, some comments about what future looks like, and then uh, I will uh, introduce, I will talk about what we did over the last year, some of the things that we have done in the last year. So uh, CHAMP++ is not a language in the usual sense of like uh, Lisp or something, but it is uh, a alternative to something like MPI or UPC, not an alternative to C++. It is a style of writing programs with C++, and it, it has its own ecosystem of uh, debuggers and libraries and so on, and its signature strength is its adaptive runtime system, and it has three key ideas that we should keep in mind when we uh, hear the rest of the talks. One of them is over decomposition, which is the idea that we want the programmer to decompose the work units and data units into many more pieces than there are execution units. And these may be nodes or cores, depending on how you uh, approach it. Uh, but, and so this is not so hard with MPI decomposition. You just overdo it, okay? But it's in terms of logical units, never in terms of physical processors. And so once these are expressed in terms of logical units, uh, we want these units to be migratable at runtime. That is, programmer or runtime can migrate them typically runtime. You never address your messages to processors. You address them to the logical data unit or work unit, the objects in case of CHAMP++. This means the runtime system must keep track of where things live, and it does that efficiently, um, with all that location and name and management. And the third thing is now that you have many, many objects on each node or core, uh, who runs next? Who should make that decision about who runs next? And we don't want to leave that decision to the programmer. We give programmers some control, but we want the runtime to schedule things based on availability of data. This is our message-driven execution that is now becoming very popular uh, with various names like task-based runtimes and so on. The idea that you can schedule things based on availability of data flexibly is very powerful uh, on uh, modern machines. So CHAMP++ is a particular realization of this model where these over-decomposed entities are C++ objects, they are called chars. These have methods that can be invoked uh, remotely, and those methods are called entry methods. So entry method is a defining feature of what makes a C++ object a char. These chars can be organized into collections, so you might have a one-dimensional collection of chars and a three-dimensional collection of chars in the same program, and these collection, individual chars within a collection are named or, or addressed by their index. So you might have a uh, one-dimensional sparse index, which means, for example, the indices may go from zero to a billion, uh, but only about 10,000 of the, them actually exist. Or it can be dense, one to 10,000 or one to million. You might have millions of objects in your program running on thousands of uh, uh, cores or uh, nodes for that matter. Um, and uh, so just pictorially to see what happens when you invoke a method, uh, like here, the orange object is wanting to invoke a method foo with some parameters on the 23rd member of the collection A. Well, those parameters are uh, packaged into an envelope. The address of that object and foo is stamped on the envelope, essentially. And then uh, the runtime system takes over and figures out where that lives and puts it in a queue on that processor. There is always a scheduler on each core that's doing the message-driven scheduling. Eventually, when this uh, thing comes to the front of the queue, uh, the scheduler will pick it and uh, execute the uh, entry method, leading to other such messages being formed. So this is basically the whole execution model uh, for CHAMP++. Um, 
when you have lots of processors like this, well, the runtime system is mediating the communication and, uh, uh, and, and uh, also scheduling objects, who talks to whom, how uh, heavy or light they are. Well, uh, it knows that, and therefore, it can migrate uh, objects around to balance load or optimize communication. So once you have these three ideas, and then uh, introspection and adaptivity, you add introspection to the runtime system and adaptivity, where it can migrate things around, you get an adaptive runtime system. With that, you can do a variety of things, like dynamically balanced loads or optimized communications. You get some automatic latency tolerance. We'll talk more about that later. And you can do prefetch of data into, say, device memory, because we know exactly which memory is going to be accessed, which object is running next, and so on. So we get some predictability much better than the standard uh, principle of locality will give you. Uh, this system is relevant to exascale because for the same uh, features, the intelligent adaptive runtime system, which were developed for handling application dynamic variability, like adaptive mesh refinements and so on, actually are the features that uh, we need at the, uh, at the exascale hardware as well, extreme scale hardware, let's say. Uh, and so, so those capabilities include load balancing, task-based models, resilience, uh, we're not going to talk much about resilience this time, but as you know, CHAM++ uh, very well supports uh, resilience with multiple approaches. Those of you who have seen us at Supercomputing know this little orange cluster that we bring to allow you to unplug a node while the program continues running. So that's a um, standard feature of uh, Ch uh, CHAM++. All of these are based on object-based over decomposition. We also have power and thermal optimizations. Um, and the shrink expand capability allows us to change the number of nodes and cores allocated to the job during execution. Well, nodes mainly uh, uh, right now, we're working on uh, other ways of uh, switching cores on and off for a job. And this is useful in cloud, but this is also useful in more flexible resource management uh, of, of, of uh, large scale machines. Um, so, uh, I, I showed this last year at IEEE Computer. We had an article, Power, Reliability, and Performance, One System to Rule Them All. Of course, we didn't name the rule uh, system in the title because you all know that's CHAM++. So anyways, so, uh, um, and so this is kind of the, uh, the, the sketch that the IEEE Computer guys made for, for, uh, for this. There is a resource manager that's at the machine level. There is a runtime system that is at the job level. And they communicate uh, through the shrink, expand, and uh, other interfaces, allowing that communication between job and machine resource managers is key. And of course, for that, the job uh, manager has to be able to do stuff adaptively, like shrink and expand. Um, so though that's enough about capabilities. Well, CHAM++ interoperates with MPI, either in time or in space, or both. Um, it interoperates with OpenMP. It also has its own capabilities for loop parallelism. And uh, you, you will hear that we now have an integrated OpenMP, our own OpenMP runtime. You can use the standard OpenMP, or you can use our OpenMP runtime uh, to, uh, um, which is implemented inside of an LL LLVM. Um, probably no time to talk about this. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so I will skip that. But basically, this OpenMP loops can be fired from any core, and they, they will chunks will run on any other core if necessary. That's kind of the key. You can think of it as nested parallelism. Uh, we'll skip that. Um, all right. So the second point I want to talk about is some of the challenges of the coming era. Um, and these are in extreme scale as well as in some of them are in uh, both scales. Uh, one of the recent theses from my group, Bill Gachun, who finished last year and is at IBM Research now, or did work on variability, measuring variability and how to deal with variability. Just picking one plot from there on machines like uh, uh, <clears throat> Edison, Cab, and Stampede, we observed significant variability core to core just running a DGEM, right? And uh, you, you can see maybe 20% uh, variation in speed. So, and that's going to get worse. Um, blue, blue Waters was good, but of course, if you turn tur Turbo Boost on, you get more variability. Um, and it's still better to turn, turn the Turbo Boost on, but the trend now is more towards such variability and towards fat nodes. And fat nodes may not be GPGPUs, but that's one of them, right? And so fat nodes means a lot of compute capability on a single node. 
That is going to complicate things in a variety of ways, in particular about latency tolerance, but we'll come to that in, in a second. But if you look at the balance criteria that people used to talk about earlier, was one byte of communication, external communication for one flop of compute capability. Well, that went da uh, down below one, even at Cray XT3. And then, uh, but then look at what, what the trend is. Uh, Titan was at 100, more than 100 fold uh, uh, injection bandwidth is what I'm looking at. And if you look at Summit and Sierra, they are way down there, more than 1,000 fold. Uh, for, uh, so this is a problem, okay? And now let's see what, what to, I'm not talking about solutions complete, uh, necessarily. I'm not saying Charm will solve all the problems, but there is one Charm related connection there. But I just want to talk about the problem. Uh, so. So this reminded me of, uh, you know, some of you have heard me say this before, first law of holes. If you find yourself in a hole, stop digging. And we seem to not able to do that. We have this one teraflop size hole, and the communication channel between these uh, is this indicated by the orange, and, in, and, and we just created that a deeper hole. Uh, and, and of course, unfortunately, we cannot, fortunately, we cannot keep from digging because a single node by itself is a unit that people want to sell and use. And so that single node making it very efficient is obviously the right thing to do. And so you will get these deeper holes and we have to deal with them uh, somehow, right? That's one part of our, uh, our future. And um, I'm going to say a little bit about, uh, about that in terms of how Charm can be useful in part to filling that hole. Uh, or at least making uh, making the situation better, in that if you typically caricature an MPI computation, it is compute, communicate, compute, communicate. You can try to move the sends up and re uh, receives down, or whichever way it works, and then uh, you may get a little bit better. But you still are spending a lot of time waiting for communication. If you have over-decomposed computation, you don't have that. You basically have, get two benefits. One is that injection is happening throughout the time step because there are multiple objects injecting into the system. And then latency of that communication is being tolerated because you have something else to do. Some other communication already arrived, so you can work on it. And so you get much better overlap. This idea, that, and this ends up using the communication network more efficiently. Otherwise, you are just using the communication network for a short period of time, and then you run to the vendor and say, hey, I need a faster network. Because, and why? Because, because I'm using the communication network only 20% of the time, and during that 20% of the time, I want it to be as fast as possible because next generation nodes are becoming faster. Um, well, that's what, one of the study that uh, Phil Miller did in his thesis was about Chambo, and you look at x-axis is time, y-axis is per millisecond how much data is injected. You don't have to look at the numbers, I will just tell you that it was something like 25 to 30 megabytes in the peaks. So at times, we are injecting 25, 30 megabytes into the network. Um, what's it, mega or giga, yeah. Um, and I forget the unit, whether it's per node or per, no, can be per node. Uh, so that's the injection that's going on, leave aside the units, but when you, an experimental version of Chambo and Charm actually managed to uh, improve that situation, you can see that multiple units are injecting data at multiple times in the network, and so the communication is spread out, injection is spread out, and as a result, the peaks are much, much reduced. Um, so I'm going to switch gears. So that's a thing to talk about uh, throughout. I think uh, the whole community will be talking about these communication issues uh, for, the, for the next couple of years. We'll see how it goes. Um, I want to do the part three of my talk about highlights from the last year. I will be five. Okay, well, you're hiding five. I thought it's just minutes. Okay. Um, so. So, but I will finish in less than five. Uh, adaptive MPI is actually uh, our implementation of MPI standard on CHAM++. I always call it uh, the old wine in the new bottle, turning the metaphor on its head. Uh, those of you who love CHAM++ will say, why go to MPI? But those of you who love MPI, uh, it's very difficult for, uh, for you, uh, you to switch to uh, CHAM++. It provides you the same interface and all the runtime capabilities. And, uh, and so this has made significant progress during the last year. I could say because of the fact that we have a DOE SBIR grant uh, for it at Charmworks, uh, and that's true, but also it is largely true because we have Sam White. And Sam has been single-mindedly pushing uh, uh, adaptive MPI 
uh, and, uh, and, and, and getting, getting it to work with help from other, other people uh, uh, to him. And so, uh, so we expect uh, within the next uh, year uh, that AMPI takes its place along with other MPI implementations at, uh, like MPitch and uh, MVAPitch and all, all those as another standard compliant MPI implementation with all these new capabilities. Speaking of Charmworks, Charmworks is the startup sp uh, spin-off from, from our group. Uh, which is which is working on a variety of ways in which improving Champ plus plus and in, during the last year it uh, it worked on several engineering tasks. We tend to try to move the engineering task which our group was doing and is still proud to uh, continue to do that. But we, as many of those engineering tasks as we can, we are moving them to Charmworks. Uh, PPL will be the ultimate place where uh, the uh, software rests. And if Chamber goes away, people will, con will continue to do those engineering tasks, which we have done for the last 15, 20 years. But now at least we have a significant hope that we can focus more at the university on the research and leave the uh, implementations, uh, leave the uh, improvement to implementation to Chamworks. All the improvements have been merged into the university version. There is no fork. Um, so one of the things that we improved a lot last year is one-sided communication. We use it with the existing API, but we also have an API change, a new API in Champ++ to avoid uh, co copies. Uh, Nitin will hopefully briefly talk about it uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, we also have significant command line simplification. We can actually uh, not have to do all these plus plus PPN and calculations, you can just say, I want to launch this job on 20 nodes and put two processes on each node and a couple other variants of that. So different simple a combination that simplify your life are being supported. The system will figure out how many cores are there and so on and so forth. And so that's part of the thing that Charm, uh, Charmworks did. Another exciting development this year is CharmPy, um, which is again, started by Juan Galvez as his hobby project or whatever. Uh, he just uh, heard a talk by Esan, Tutoni, or P PPLR who has implemented HPAT and Intel. And uh, hearing about Python, he's always a Python enthusiast. He kind of worked on his weekends and evenings and then came to me one day and said, I have a, a basic implementation of uh, Python on Champ++. And then on other students have joined and we have done a parallel Python implementation. You'll hear about it. I think that's quite an exciting uh, development. Uh, so one of the students who helped is Karthik, and Karthik uh, is working also on a connected components uh, library. This, this, I think, will be a very useful library of, uh, across multiple domains. It's a distributed implementation of the union fine data structure. Uh, Edgar, uh, Professor Edgar Solomnik, whom some of you know as a PPL uh, undergrad student from just a few years ago, uh, but he's a professor now, and he, uh, he, he has been a great uh, resource here, uh, Karthik did his class, uh, this, uh, extended this project, and then there's a lot of formal improvements being made to it with uh, Edgar's involvement. Um, and so this library we expect to release soon. We, we, we hope it will be useful, used by uh, the astronomy community for cluster finding and so on. And there are other uses in other, other systems as well. Speaking of astronomy, there's a paratreat framework which goes well beyond astronomy, but it's one of the applications. And we have eight faculty from five institutions. Uh, we just got a seed grant uh, recently and we have, uh, well, over the last year or so, and we have been developing a framework for parallel algorithms for distributed tree structured data. So whether it's arc trees or um, other kinds of KD trees and so on, and applications can, so, so basically abstracting over decompositions, tree types, traversals, algorithms, IO, will be very modularly abstracted over in this library. Of course, underneath will be Champ++ doing load balancing. Uh, one other thing I will mention is parallel discrete event simulation, charades, uh, and uh, this has made significant progress. Uh, Eric McKenna will defend his thesis next month, hopefully, and then he will talk about it. Uh, modern C++ in the runtime, finally. Until 6.8, we w did not use uh, C++ 11. By modern, I only mean C++ 11, not 14 and not 17. But it, uh, we, we were constrained because BlueGene uh, com uh, was uh, Intel, IBM compiler on BlueGene wasn't supporting that and we needed that. So, but six point, uh, after 6.8, we have stopped uh, sub, uh, uh, requiring that. So now we require that uh, you must have C++ 11 
com uh, compliant compiler. Of course, your own code could be C++11 even before, but the runtime was not allowed to. So now we can use C++11 atomics and so on. And actually, a related th uh, thought is that we have uh, many people interested in using modern C++ on top of CHAMP++ to simplify uh, some of it. And you hear a talk from Joseph and Nils about that. Uh, there are many other talks. Ron's talk comes next, and uh, DK Panda will talk tomorrow morning. And there's going to be a panel on architecture convergence between big data and CSC. Uh, I'm hoping to stir a little bit of controversy and fun with, with that. So we'll see how it, that goes. All right, with that, I'll stop. Thank you. Um,